Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments and subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. This week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at four mining stocks that have current yield, current income, current dividend from 1% to 14%. Let's check out what these stocks do. Let's look at revenue, EBITDA earnings, free cash flow, check out their debt levels, look at the f dividend, and figure out if they're an interesting stock to buy. Now, you know inflation is going off and around the world as interest rates are rising as, as central banks are trying to combat that. And what we want to do is find out real assets. What is, what's truly of value in this world? If the countries, if the currencies of these countries are fluctuating in value, ultimately what matters is a real asset. What is a real asset? A real asset is something that can be consumed or turned into a good that's used. Iron, uh, copper, nickel, aluminum, uh, these are elements and, and, and assets that are used to make equipment and machinery that are fundamental to our current lives. For example, every EV car takes up to 200 pounds of copper to make one vehicle. It's almost four times as much as an internal combustion engine. So let's take a look at copper mining companies. Now, this is nothing new, but the prices of these commodities have fallen recently, and that might set up an interesting opportunity to buy these stocks. All right, so let's, let's get to work. Before we get into the review, I want to thank today's sponsor, Southern New Hampshire University. Now, you know education is very important to me. I studied finance, I work in finance, and I would not have been able to get where I am today but for my degree in finance. And I want to try to convey that and teach that to you. It's why I started this YouTube channel, and that's why I chose to sponsor with SNHU. SNHU is one of the largest accredited nonprofit online degree offerings in the country, the U.S. They feature over 200 degree programs focused on getting you started or advancing you in a career that you love. One program I think you will like is SNHU's finance degree. My degree is in finance and I highly recommend looking into this programming. In this program, you'll learn how to develop financial plans for clients, explore domestic and global economic environments, analyze financial statements to forecast and meet organizational goals, use methodologies to make sound financial decisions, and apply compliant ethical and legal practices. This program will prepare you for a variety of roles such as a financial analyst, a professional banker, an accountant, a risk manager, a financial consultant. In fact, every company that I've reviewed on this channel needs an accounting staff and a finance staff to be able to report their numbers. Plus, you can even choose a financial planning concentration, in which case you could study for the Certificate of Financial Planning. All SNHU's programming are extremely flexible. There is no set class time and they allow you to work when and where you want. If you already have college credits, you don't have to start over. SNHU will let you transfer up to 90 credits towards your bachelor's degree or up to 12 credits towards your master's. So if you're interested in switching to a career you love, I highly encourage you to check out SNHU's offering. You can go to snhu.edu slash rational investing for more information and I'll put a link in the description below. All right, the first real asset company we want to check out is BHP Group Limited. Now, behind me is their enterprise value uh, chart over the last decade. And what you're going to see here is that the blue line, the enterprise value, that's both debt and market cap, is relatively flat over this period of time. The green line has slowly grown as the debt has been slowly purchased, bought down. And you're going to find this is a consistent theme over the last decade for many of these mining stocks. Many of these mining companies have taken their free cash flow and they've bought down debt and they bought back shares, even though the stock itself has gone somewhat sideways because during this period of time, investing in real assets was not the soup du jour, right? It was not the thing people were doing. They were buying SaaS, work, SaaS companies. They were buying uh, EV companies themselves. They were speculating a whole lot of other things. Now the, the tables have turned. Investors are searching for income producing assets and real assets, something that can be, um, uh, something can hold up its value to inflation. That's the main thing. And, 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 and a real asset can do that because a real asset has an inherent value, much like a barrel of oil. A barrel of oil has a value to it regardless of the currency it's measured in. That barrel of oil produces so much gigajoules of energy 
and that can be translated into any currency. It doesn't even matter, even crypto. It doesn't matter because the barrel of oil is a real asset and does something that no currency can do. The currency is merely a way of taking your hourly work and converting it into a real asset. That's what the currencies are for rather than bartering. Currencies themselves have no underlying value. What, what is value is real, it's a barrel of oil, it's a ton of tin, a ton of aluminum, it's steel, it's iron ore, those are real assets. So it, over this period of time, historically, real assets have not been favored. I think going forward, we are definitely gonna see that real assets have the ability to pass through uh, inflation cost and uh, as they and, and should turn a little bit higher. So let's take a look, let's continue on with uh, BHP. Oh, one last thing. Uh, $230 billion uh, market cap, and you can see debt has come down from $15 billion to $700 million. That monster pay down only came from them using hard cash to buy down that debt. So now that the debt is so down, what are they doing with the debt? They're paying dividends. Here's their actual earnings. So you can see earnings spiking more recently. This is 2020 to 2022. I think as we've seen more deflation, excuse me, more inflation and pressure on the dollar, uh, you've seen commodity prices take off. Earnings have gone from $18 billion to $37 billion. Again, been that high before and kind of fallen. The commodity stocks do tend to ebb and flow. If you're buying it, they're definitely buying it for a long time. What I like is the debt has come down. Debt has come down dramatically and they've used their cash, their free cash flow to do this. So now that the debt is down, that free cash flow can go to buying back shares and dividends. Here's the enterprise value to cash flow. So the enterprise value to EBITDA, currently 3.4 times. That means if they can maintain this EBITDA for three years, they would have produced enough earnings to buy the entire company. That's a nice, that's a low ratio. It's also showing 20, 20 times free cash flow. That's very, very high. They're probably not going to keep that up. If you just kind of look at this cycle, it tends to bob up and down, but you should be in this range someplace close to that. And I think a 20% 20, 20 free cash flow yield is very attractive for a company that has no debt and has an underlying fundamental uh, commodity product that, uh, that the world needs, right? BHP is a, is, is a generic producer of all, a whole host of different, uh, different commodity products. What I wanted to show you here is the cash flow itself. So blue line is the cash flow from operations, spikes up with earnings, so the accounting team is doing their job properly, good job accounting team. And the cap X, how much they have to put back in the business is relatively low. I'm surprised at that, right? They have been under investing perhaps in, in CapEx, uh, certainly related to historical terms, but that's produced a lot of free cash flow. And what they do with that cash flow is they pay out a lot of dividends. The blue line here is the dividend that they pay out. So dividends are up. I will caution you, the dividends are variable. As earnings go up, dividends go up. As earnings come down, dividends come down, but they do pay a dividend and it has been, cons it has been paid out regularly, but the dollar amount has varied. Next, let's check out Rio Tinto, ticker RIO. So RIO or Rio is gonna have the same basic pattern that we saw with BHP, where it's, it's somewhat flat in a range uh, over a decade period of time, but debt, the purple line has come down as they bought down 17, 18 billion dollars of debt. They now have a negative debt balance, which means they have more cash than they have debt to the tune of 1.7 billion dollars on a net debt basis. That's fantastic. So this, this growth and enterprise value here is basically the decline in the debt. Earnings, earnings have done really well recently, right? They've, they've gone up over time. The revenue is $36 billion on earnings of $34 billion. That's almost a 50% EBITDA ratio. That's outstanding. Probably, probably a little high, probably going to revert down, but they are profitable every year despite the seesawing of the commodity prices themselves. They are profitable every year. And debt, like I said earlier, has come down. They have used this free cash flow that they generate to buy down debt, to buy back shares, because the stock price itself was undervalued as everyone in the world was chasing the, uh, the SaaS, works, uh, SaaS product companies and the software companies. On a relative value basis, this company is trading for 3.4 times 
granted this spike in earnings. So maybe this comes back down, maybe it's a, it's a six handle, but it's still very cheap for a business and it's yielding a 16 times free cash flow yield, which is a 10 year high for this company. Very, very interesting. If we look at just cash flow itself, that cash flow is following the line of EBITDA, which means the accounting team is doing a proper job expensing cash and operating expenses correctly. They had $25 billion of operating cash flow. They had to put $7 billion back in CapEx. That leaves a lot of money left to kick out dividends because their debt is so low. Dividends. Dividend is the blue line. Purple line is the yield. The dividend has been paid out every year. The dollar amount has varied, but you're getting paid to wait, paid for some growth. And currently, it's yielding about 10%. Freeport McMorrin, all right, FCX is the ticker. This one, kind of again, the same story, although a little bit more of a pop because they produced cop they produce copper, they're the world's largest producer of copper. And copper, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge input in EVs. It takes 200 pounds per uh, EV. Now, recently, the stock price has fallen. The green line is the market. That's fallen off a little bit. Uh, so there might be an opportunity here to look into this stock. Now, if we look at revenue, revenue is $22 billion last fiscal year on $10 billion of earnings. Again, that's a near 50% EBITDA margin. That is really, really strong, kind of a peak. But I would expect this to continue to grow. Even if prices come down, the fundamental demand is going to be there for copper for a long, long time. And I do, I do really like that. They have used their free cash to buy debt. So you're buying a company, all of these companies basically are very variable in their earnings, in their revenue, as commodity prices fluctuate, as demand fluctuates, you know, who knows what's gonna happen with, if China starts their economy back up or not, like they're a huge draw of, um, of commodities. But what I do like is that the debt itself is so low, uh, there's less risk to the equity owners, uh, owners the, uh, these, these mining, these asset heavy businesses aren't overburdened with debt and they can handle a year or two of negative earnings uh, while you wait for the commodity cycle to play out. On a, on a multiple basis, Freeport currently trading at 4.58 enterprise value to EBITDA. That is a, uh, that's a, that's a historic low, a low is 3.2 basically, but, but almost a decade low. Free cash flow yield 13.8%, very, very high free cash flow yield. If I look at free cash flow itself, you can see free cash flow is covering CapEx with this giant spike. Some years, they put more money in CapEx when they open a new mine, right? It's going to be very capital intensive and that new mine produces cash flow and CapEx comes down. So it does seesaw more than some of the other businesses, uh, but it does seem like in the long term, they're certainly able to cover it because they've paid off all their debt. Finally, the dividend in Freeport has been very variable. It's been zero for a long time. Uh, so I would caution that they can take that to zero if, if they lose money. Alcoa. Alcoa is an aluminum manufacturer. Let's check this one out. So Al Alcoa has recently come down a lot in price. You can see the green market cap has come down. I'm, I'm guessing electricity prices have gone up and electricity is a huge input in the manufacturing of aluminum. Earnings. Earnings are pretty flat. $12 billion on $2 billion of, or $2.7 billion of earnings. The earnings seem to be kind of peaking at 2.7. Um, but, but interesting, nonetheless, the, the leverage for Alcoa is next to zero. You can see they've paid off almost all of their debt. The multiple that this company trades is 2.5 times. That is very, very low and 12% free cash flow. Now that's on a very high earnings number, but it's still a low number and gives you, this number could double to five and it would still not be at the peak of what uh, this company is valued at historically. Free cash flow itself seems to cover CapEx almost every single year. Last year, they made $920 million of free, of free cash flow and had 390 million of CapEx. The dividend yield is fairly new for the stock, right? They just started issuing a dividend. It's four cents a share currently yielding 1%, one, 1%, but they do appear to have enough cash to keep that up. All right, if you liked what you saw here, but you want more detail on these stocks, I produce one pagers at my cash flow club at the website cashflowinvestingpro.com. 
check out that website. You can also see in the link down below a free one pager. What is a cash flow one pager? I'm glad you asked. Well, it is a 10 year forecast of historical revenue, EBITDA, debt levels, uh, and free cash flow. We give a forecast for enterprise value based on EBITDA and a free cash flow method. And we do a little write up that says what we think the stock could do out in the future. Again, looking 10 years out. Now, the Cash Flow Club, we do summarize over 100 stocks, and we've recently published a list of all the stocks that we're currently tracking, our forecast, and where the IRR is coming up on these stocks. And with the recent meltdown, some of these stocks are projected, projected to produce 20, 25% IRR if purchased and held for over a decade. These are very, very strong returns. I think the overall market that has come down has brought down multiples across the market. And much like when the tide flows out, it takes all boats, right? There are some cash flowing monsters out there whose market multiples have fallen down into very attractive rates. And you wanna start looking into markets like this to begin putting, putting money to work cautiously but going after companies that have growing revenue, growing EBITDA, strong free cash flow, low debt, and are well priced. And what we do is we publish in the in the cash flow one pagers the well price. How do you find a stock that meets those five criteria? Growing revenue, growing earnings, uh, strong free cash flow, low debt, and well priced. That's what we're trying to do at the Cash Flow Club. And I would encourage you to check out cashflowinvestingpro.com. Thank you very much for this video. Please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I've got more stock picks coming for you. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Bye-bye.